Tēnā koutou katoa and welcome to all our members that are joining the fifth in the Infrastructure New Zealand webinar series uh, since we've gone into COVID-19. I'd like to welcome you all um, to this webinar. We're going to be talking about how we can unlock the value that we have in our many different data sets uh, around infrastructure by combining them and using a digital twin. Uh, I'm Paul Blair, I'm the CEO of Infrastructure New Zealand. I've got a very brief part at the start here. I'm sure that as we're almost peak webinar, you guys are all very familiar with um, how to use this. But uh, key is, please put your questions into the Q&A function rather than the chat function, which is uh, disabled for you. Uh, as this is a more detailed topic, we will have uh, a bit more time going through to 11.30 today to do the Q&A. We've got some fantastic speakers, so I'd really encourage you to queue up some of those questions for us uh, and so that we can uh, have a really good discussion on this. Uh, that's it from me. I'll come back at the back end and do a wrap up. But now I'd like to hand over to Hamish Glenn, our policy director. Thanks, Hamish. Hamish, you've got your. There we go. So, morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session. It should be a very interesting one. We're going to learn about what a digital twin is, uh, what value it might provide to New Zealand. And, and then maybe how we get one up and running. We've got four excellent speakers for you today, including uh, a kickoff all the way from the UK, uh, who is up very late on a Monday night. So we will be kicking off with Mark Enzer, the uh, Chief Technology Officer at McDonald and uh, Director at the Digital Built Britain uh, Institute. We, he will be followed by Greg Preston from the Quake Centre, Sean Ordain from Wellington City Council, and Janet McBall from the Smart Cities Council, Australia, New Zealand. All right, without further ado, I will pass it over to you, Mark, to give us an introduction to uh, Digital Twins and what the UK is up to. Mark. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Hamish, and thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me. Um, it, it's really good to be with you. Uh, so I've got um, a number of slides here, but I'm going to shoot through them pretty quickly. I'd like to introduce the National Digital Twin Programme and what we're doing in the UK. Uh, so just to just to kick it all off and say this is all in pursuance uh, of the vision for Digital Built Britain, uh, which is looked after by CBB. That's the Centre for Digital Built Britain. Uh, it's a partnership between um, our uh, government department for, um, for business uh, and Cambridge University. And if we can just jump onto the next slide. What's kicked this whole journey off? Uh, is a report that came out a few years back from our National Infrastructure Commission, which was called Data for the Public Good. Uh, and at a high level, what that recommended was that as a nation, we should move towards having a national digital twin. Uh, and that to enable that, uh, we should put in place an information management framework. I'll come back in a bit to explain a little bit more about what that is. And then in order to enable that, we should bring together people from across um, the industry, uh, government and academia to pull in the same direction to enable the information management framework to deliver the national digital twin. So that sounds, uh, I'm sorry, one more click, please. So what that means really uh, in terms of, sorry, back one, in terms of a focus uh, is that we uh, would be uh, delivering the information management framework, um, which would enable the national digital twin. And in order to do that, we're aligning the industry. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and as I think uh, is important to get established uh, on this journey uh, is that we are dealing with a, a system issue here, uh, and therefore we need to see our infrastructure as a system of systems. It's a complex, interconnected uh, system of systems uh, comprising our economic infrastructure, our social infrastructure, and the interface with the natural environment. One more click, please, uh, which makes up this amazing thing, which is our built environment. Um, and I think it's only when we see that built environment as a system can we then unlock some of the system value. And one of the key ones on the next slide uh, is to see it as a cyber physical system. Uh, and so this is recognizing the value of digital assets. And when we bring our digital assets and our physical assets together, uh, then we have something that is truly smart. It's a cyber physical system. Uh, and effectively what we're talking about here is applying the thinking of industry 4.0 uh, to our built environment. Um, and uh, all of this is neatly summarized in a report which came out just last week actually called Flourishing Systems. So rather than go through that just now, 
um, I would commend it to you. If you just Google it, you can see uh, what uh, our thinking is uh, on the systems thinking, uh, which we see as being really key kind of foundational um, establishment of, of um, how we can get these, uh, these digital twins to, uh, to work for us in the built environment. So enough of all that background, um, getting in now to what a digital twin is. And I think in talking about that, it's very useful uh, to understand this information value chain. It's pretty simple. It's kind of saying that we take data in, it comes from the environment in many different forms, uh, but it's just data. And we had to do something useful with it. Um, we, we had to, to cleanse it. We have to get it into the right kind of structure, but it's still just data. Uh, and so to get value out of it, we need to make sense of it. We need to analyze it. And that analysis uh, gives us um, insight. That insight can then feed into better decision-making. And it's that better decision-making that then drives better interventions, which lead to better outcomes uh, in the physical world. Uh, and so what we have here is a direct link between data and outcomes, and that really matters. But the pivot point, the bit that unlocks the value, is the better decisions. So that's all very nice and very theoretical. Uh, but if we go on to the next slide, we can see how that definition can be wrapped around a digital twin. And we can see a digital twin effectively as the embodiment of that information value chain. Uh, and so at a simple level, a digital twin is a digital representation of something physical, but that's not really enough to describe it because the key thing that makes it a twin is the connection to the physical. So you've got your physical asset, you've got your digital assets in digital twin, uh, it's connected via data. Uh, and then within the twin, we're generating insights, facilitating better decisions, which drive those interventions back into the physical world. And so I think uh, a lot of people will be very familiar with the concepts of modeling uh, and a lot of the core of digital twins will be built on the same principles as modeling. But the key thing, the key thing that makes this different uh, and that makes it so exciting is that connection with the, with the physical. It's that data connection. And if we move on to the next slide, we can see that if we like digital twins um, for driving these better decisions and better interventions, then it makes real sense to think about connecting our twins. And the connection between them really is, is data. It's just sharing uh, data between the other twins. Uh, and so it obviously makes sense in the context of transport uh, to be sharing data between uh, the trains and the track and the signaling. But if we move on to the next slide, we can start to think bigger than that. Uh, sorry, slide before. Start to think bigger than that. Uh, and what we see is an ecosystem of connected twins uh, where we can be sharing data uh, between organizations and sectors uh, which then effectively facilitate better decisions at, at different levels. Uh, we envisage this unlocking all sorts of uh, value um, on the next slide, um, which I won't go into in detail, but definitely benefits to society, the economy, to business environment, uh, and we'd be very happy to come back and dig into that more in the questions. The way we're going about this on the next slide um, is to try and merge um, a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. Uh, and so we've established a digital twin hub. Uh, this is for practitioners. The idea really is to learn by doing and then progress by sharing. Uh, and we have something like 300 members uh, looking to, uh, to be in that DT hub. Uh, and the idea is that that would generate content from experience. So a key bit of the content would be to generate um, uh, an understanding of what good practice is, turn that good practice into guidance, turn the guidance into standards. But also we see that we can generate uh, use cases which can be shared, which can then feed into other people's business cases. So that's really useful from the bottom up where we kind of grow standards from experience. Uh, but also we see that we need uh, some top down expert um, um, input. Uh, and, and this we've uh, called the information management framework which I said I'd come back to. Uh, so this we're seeing as a semantic solution uh, to enabling secure, resilient data sharing across organizational boundaries. Uh, and what we think we need in there uh, is um, a consistent approach to data modeling, which is facilitated by this foundation data model. We think we need a consistent approach to reference data management, uh, which comes from this federated distributed reference data library. And we think we need an integration architecture, uh, which is really um, the pipe work, which will connect it all up. Uh, and then that expert input needs to be tested and validated by practitioners and hence the connection between them. Uh, again, I'd be really happy to dig into what's going on in practice in, in, in each of those. And then my final slide, 
uh, is just to say that we think all of this should be driven by values um, because um, the overall program could easily be multi-decade, multi-generation, uh, and uh, all sorts of changes can happen over that time, not least of which will be technology. But we think that the values will be longer lived. And so one of the very first things that we did um, as a digital framework task group uh, was to establish those values that we thought should guide us on the journey. We called them the Gemini principles. And again, I would recommend and commend that to you. So that was a, a very quick scoot through, but that's it. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Mark. Very informative and very sharp. So I'm sure there'll be a few questions coming through or that people would like to ask. If you would like to ask a question, I'd encourage you to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and send those on through. Then we will be able to have a look at those questions and elevate them and, and, and ask them to our presenters. Next up is Greg Preston, manager of the Quake Centre. Uh, so the Quake Centre was set up in the wake of the Christchurch earthquakes to take on learnings from that uh, event. And he is now going to give us a bit of a presentation on some of the thinking he's been doing on uh, a digital twin in New Zealand. Over to you, Greg. Thank you, Hamish. So as Hamish said, my name is Greg Preston and I manage the Quake Centre and the Building Innovation Partnership at the University of Canterbury. So the Quake Centre is an industry funded body set up to pass on the engineering lessons from the Canterbury earthquakes. And these are lessons that we believe are very relevant at this time. The Building Innovation Partnership is a program of work that reflects the growing importance of data and digital engineering. In the post-pandemic world, we need systems that foster innovation and maximize the benefits of our infrastructure investment. We need to pivot and take the opportunities offered by the convergence of technology and necessity. So data is at the heart of this opportunity. The current state of our infrastructure data is not great. But there's a, and there's a general lack of understanding of the value of what we have tucked away in our individual asset management systems. But as a team of just 5 million, I think we can do much better. So I'm saying let's move from having our infrastructure data siloed, disorganized and invisible. Rather, let's move to it being structured, accurate and usable. And let's make our data shareable, visible and valued. And the place to do this is in a digital twin of New Zealand's infrastructure. And as Mark said, a digital twin is a high fidelity representation of the real world that looks like, behaves like, and is connected to the real world to improve understanding for decision making. A digital twin of infrastructure the National Digital Infrastructure Model, would allow us to look at our data in many different ways. We can look at it with a geospatial lens. We can look with an economic lens. We can take a cultural viewpoint. We can look at it from the terms of resilience, operations, environment, climate, well-being. All these views can be examined and weighed up. So a national digital, digital infrastructure model has many advantages, and these include informing investment and land planning, measuring infrastructure performance, assessing risk and exposure to natural hazards, including climate change, providing a single source of truth for emergency management, and aiding the transition to a low carbon economy. And there are a number of other advantages beyond these ones. So let's look at a few hot topics of the moment. Firstly, the Risk and Resilience Forum is taking a very serious look at the issues surrounding insurance and risk management of New Zealand's infrastructure. A key area that, that has to be tackled is the lack of good, consistent data. We literally do not know what we own and how much it is worth. We need to standardize our data and make it visible in one place. 
Another hot topic is the shovel-worthy projects and the fast deployment models discussed here a few weeks back. Effective alliance delivery requires coordinated systems working with consistent data and the ability to view that data on different scales. We need to be able to zoom in to individual projects or zoom out to the organizational level or even a regional or national scale. The award-winning rebuild efforts of Skirt and Nectar have demonstrated the value of integrated information systems to plan and manage big programs of work. A third topic is the infrastructure pipeline. A national digital infrastructure model could be used in conjunction with a forward work sphere to aggregate future programs of work allowing coordination of physical work over different time scales from the next few months up to the next decade. And this tool could go a long way to managing our boom and bust construction cycles. So how do we go forward? Common data is at the center of the solution. Common data means data based on common data standards. Common data means federation and sharing data in ways that allow analysis and meaningful decision making. So today we are launching a think piece on the advantages of a national digital infrastructure model and how it can be used to link with many other data sources and other digital twins, such as the great work being done in Wellington, which Sean will talk about next. Supported by a range of organizations, the Think Piece is a call to action for the sector to come together, to take managing our data seriously and to build the collaboration needed for the digital national infrastructure model to work. We need a range of things to happen, from leadership and resources, all the way down to the minutiae of data standards implementation and governance. But the good news is that we already have most of what is needed. We just need to pull it together into a coherent picture. So let's take that step into the future. Let's build a digital twin of New Zealand's infrastructure, the national digital infrastructure model, and reap the benefits of our common data. We look forward to your feedback on this and hope you will become involved in the oversight groups and working groups needed to deliver the benefits to all New Zealanders. Thanks, and back to you, Hamish. Thank you very much, Greg. That was excellent. So just uh, letting everybody know that that report and indeed the presentation slides that you see today uh, will be available from our website. So if you see anything uh, there already, Mark and Greg have put up some fascinating slides, go and pull them from our website a little bit later on and the report uh, can be found under our report section. Okay, next up we have Sean Ordain, who is the City Innovation uh, Partnership Lead at Wellington City Council. Um, he is going to have, talk to us today about an application, um, or partly on an application that they recently put through to the Infrastructure Reference Group uh, to help establish and promote a digital twin in New Zealand. So very much look forward to hearing what you have to say, Sean. Thanks, Amish. So um, if we just carry on for a bit with the slides. So I thought I'd just start by talking about how some of these digital twins vary. So many people will be uh, conversant with product twins and building twins. They're the ones you normally see. City and national twins are something quite different. They operate much more like data markets where you have essentially the, footprint, the digital footprints of organizations interacting and transacting uh, within them. So if you think about things like uh, database, building consents, resource consents, rules as code, there's all sorts of interesting technologies in there, which are having the city and its processes mimicked in that digital realm to make the physical world a bit of a better place. So next slide. At the moment, this is what Wellington's twin looks like. Um, it's made up of uh, parametric data, it's made up of LIDAR data, there's BIM data in there. And what we're doing is basically slowly synthesizing what our city looks like and how our city works. And if we go to the next slide, you can start to see how that gives us some insight. 
So if you look at, uh, until the pandemic, Wellington was growing considerably above its uh, uh, growth curves. And you can see just by this simple graphic, all the red buildings got built over the last 10 years or so, all the blue buildings got demolished. The really interesting thing for us is when we talk about growing by 50 to 80,000 people, what we're talking about is accommodating about six to seven times the number of red buildings in that area. And it's also about moving that conversation beyond just houses. A lot of those buildings are not houses. There's logistics hubs, there are schools, there are office buildings. There's all sorts of things that go into making a city and a successful city. And it's only when you start to see data like this that you begin to understand what those town planners are talking about and the infrastructure challenges that come along with it. So if we go to the next slide, the, um, <coughs> oh dear, <laughs> there we go. The, uh, what we've been doing with this data is essentially mobilizing it. So one of the challenges we've got is as we roll out citywide census systems, the sheer amount of data we receive to make our policy decisions and inform our elected members and communities with just grows exponentially. So for example, this is what all the parking sensor data across Wellington looks like. This is what sea level looks like. And so one of the key things with, with us has been getting to the first to zero program. So how the city is going to adapt to sea level rise, what sea level rise means for us, for our financial systems, for our culture, for us, our citizens. And by using data like this, we can A, compare scientific models, but we can also begin to see what environmental factors uh, have, what effect they have on our infrastructure and on our our rates, on our insurance profiles, all sorts of things. And it becomes key to making those big city changing decisions over time. So if we go to the next slide, what we've worked out over time is that a digital twin for us at a city level uh, contains most of these elements. So you've got consumable regulation. So at the moment we have the rubric project, which is taking the RMA and turning it into machine executable code base. That means that that behaves like a computer code where you can evaluate buildings for their compliance. It also allows us to understand what is things like embodied carbon, what's the impact on our networks. And more importantly, how can we give greater transparency and speed to our consenting processes? but also begin to understand how effective they are. Are we requiring rules with very high transactional costs for little gain, or do we have a relatively good bang for buck? And as we review our district plan, this starts to give us the insights we need to make far better regulation. We've all been also renewing our BIM programs, which uh, we've used to speed up a number of consents, but more importantly, make those consents much more intelligible to our community and to our decision makers. The other ones that are interesting are the data structuring and AI programs. So cities have pasts as well as futures. What that has been doing is taking all of our archives, scanning them, geocoding them, tagging them, and then using those databases to feed machine learning to understand how our city's changed and what's happened. And if we go to the next slide, you start to end up with the thing that looks like this at the city level. I'm terribly sorry, this is what my brain looks like on the inside. You can see it's a rather interesting place. Across the top of what we're looking to use things for, the simulation, the civic budgeting, the responsive environments. On the very bottom of the technologies and, uh, and viewpoints we're looking for, and in the middle are the various states. So one of the key things we have to uh, always underline is this stuff relies on standards. Most of what I'm talking to you about is about how we use it. But without that bedrock of standards and governance and that consciousness of privacy, uh, it doesn't really work. Probably the one key thing to take away from uh, this view is those multiple pasts and multiple futures. That's what makes city twins slightly distinct from the other types of twins you see. So if we go to the next slide, um, and this is how we start to mobilize the data in other ways. So for example, this is this was used with our community to make alcohol regulations in Kilburnie and Kelvin. What you're seeing is all of the police data to do with alcohol related crime located into the places it happened. This was put in front of us, our public and our councillors, and this is what was used to make those decisions. It's not why we built a digital twin, but for the first time we could make good evidence-based transparent decisions uh, using that, that capability. If we look at another example, the, um, so if we change slides, 
this is what a district plan looks like when you begin to code it. So this is what that, this is the residential chapter of our district plan and the logic diagrams which underlie it. The key with this is this kind of work, this regulation as code, begins to feed in our decision-making layers and infrastructure to make them transparent, but also have them interact with the data. This is the lubricant we're using essentially to take those quite traditional data silos and integrate them directly into our decision-making, but make that decision-making much clearer, much more democratic. And if you go to the next slide, um, you've also got examples like this one where we've used uh, twins to locate solar energy into the city. We've done this by uh, essentially to defer investment in, uh, in an electricity substation, but also to make the city more sustainable. Uh, the other useful thing is it's let us put uh, community charging points in. So under, under certain letterboxes in Wellington, you'll see USB chargers. It means you can charge your cell phone when the networks go out uh, after an earthquake. Go to the next slide. Um, you've also seen digital twin used for equity. So we have Waitoki here. For six months before that building was completed, we had librarians laying out their books. We had accessibility advocates going through that building. We had kindergarten teachers writing their lesson plans. Everybody knew that environment before the building was finished. What that meant was the commissioning process was certain and it was fast. Uh, we also replicated that in Manor Street when we built our new service center in 10 weeks. And if you go to the next slide, this is probably the most exciting one. This is how we've been using it during the coronavirus. So what you see on the left is a big model of the city. All those yellow orbs are hotel rooms. Uh, on the right are some of the feeds coming out of the health board. What that does is it lets us see how, uh, how our city environments can be best adapted to help contain the virus and how we can proactively keep it out of high density areas and deal with quarantine cases. So if we go to the last slide, um, oh, we'll skip that, that's just earthquakes. Um, in terms of what we've been doing with our cities in uh, other cities in New Zealand, we've worked with Christchurch, with Auckland, Hamilton, uh, Taupo, a whole bunch of districts to put forward a shovel ready uh, bid for the uh, uh, Crown Infrastructure Partners process. What that did was said, we have certain projects in the cities which can be aggregated up nationally and scaled nationally if we have the funds. And so what we've done is put that forward and then suggested the creation of an entity which would then take us forward to the future that the other speakers uh, have outlined. So I think I'm out of time, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Sean. Excellent, that will kick us off into some uh, conversation, no doubt, a little bit later on. All right, uh, finally, our final presenter for the day is Janet McBull. She is the Director for New Zealand for the Australia New Zealand Smart Cities Council. She's going to give us a bit of an overview of what they uh, do um, first off, and then give us a little bit bigger picture uh, view of, of what a digital twin can do for us. Over to you, Janet. Uh, might be on mute, Janet. Yep, yeah, hit your um. Is that good? Can you hear me now? Yes, Janet, you're good. Sorry, okay. All right, first of all, thank you, Hamish. Um, and just wanted to say how fantastic it has been to hear the other presentations. Of course, I, I sort of know the work that Sean's um been involved with, so it's always good to um, hear about again. So Smart Cities Council, um, born in Seattle 2012, Smart Cities Council, um, we've got presences in North America, India, Europe, Australia, New Zealand and Southeast Asia now. Um, focus, inform, and educate, convene and advocate. Um, we align what we do with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which I think is a really important point. Um, and Smart Cities Council Australia New Zealand has been active in New Zealand for a couple of years now. Last year, we had a nationwide roadshow. Um, Adam Beck, the executive director for Smart Cities Council also spoke at Tech Week um, last year. My role as director New Zealand started in January. Um, shortly afterwards, um, we managed to, just before COVID um, hit here, um, fit in a event as part of TechFest in March, um, looking at tech and data for sustainable cities and communities um, in Hamilton in partnership with Hamilton City Council, Algam, 
and two ends. We brought together academia, the tech sector and councils and considered opportunities and challenges around smart, the smart cities movement in New Zealand. Um, and that was look closely looking at SDG 11. Um, another thing that we've, we've sort of done this year is launch the Centre for Data Leadership. This is a partnership with our members providing support to organisations seeking to use data and insights to fuel prosperity, productivity and sustainability. And there are a number of ways you can engage with the centre. I won't go through those now. You can just have a look at the website when you've got a chance. So as part of the Centre for Data um, Leadership, we recently launched the Digital Twin Hub, so which is quite topical, obviously, for today. Um, this is designed similar to, obviously, the one in um, Britain um, that's been talked about, and it was actually modelled on. Um, this is a resource hub for Australia and New Zealand to help promote the benefits of digital twin technology and pull together a marketplace with good demand and supply to help activate data. Um, and I think that word activate is quite important here and create value um, for policymakers, practitioners, researchers and uh, community. So a bit of background there, um, our digital twin work to date. Um, so Smart Cities Week, which is an annual event um, and it's going on at the moment from April to November is a number of sessions over a few months this year. Um, but on day two of last year's Smart Cities Week, we held a national digital twin symposium involving the digital twin community in Australia, the head of department um, of the person of the produ who produced the Singapore digital twin and Sean was there as well. Um, workshopping at that session identified an opportunity to pull together a digital twin task force. So the task force then leveraged the next slide, um, leveraged the Smart Cities Council's Smart Cities Activator platform um, to, to collaborate on a number of pieces of work, including the guidance note. Um, the tw digital twin guidance note, which was re released uh, recently, provides essential definition and structure. Um, uh, it was developed in collaboration with our partner company, PCSG, um, who actually referred to the digital twin as an antidote to, an antidote to the digital chaos out there. Um, just like the presenters today, um, us and our members felt is essential to provide as much clarity as possible on what a digital twin is, its benefits, how to prepare a strategy, uh, for its application. Um, and the guidance note, importantly, was created with input from private and public sector stakeholders and builds on the outputs of the National Digital Twin Symposium. It also draws on the Spatial Information Council for Australia and New Zealand principles for spatially enabled digital twins um, of the built and natural environment. So these are similar to the Gemini principles that were, um, that were referred to recently for the Centre for um, Digital Built Britain's digital framework um, that the digital framework task group put out. Um, there is also the collaborative. As part of our work quarterly, we're bringing together government, academia and tech sector members for a wider conversation um, around the digital twin. So the hub, um, as mentioned, it is designed to connect those on the same journey. Essentially, it enables a strategic view of the digital twin, which, which is, um, again, an important point, um, and its potential. Uh, it facilitates leveraging this potential through a mix of the right people and the right conversations to support this work in this space across Australia and New Zealand. Six foundational, um, when you look at the guidance note, you'll, you can sort of read through this in detail, but six foundational areas um, need to come together or are covered around, um, around ensuring success with a digital twin, policy, governance, standards, um, strategy, education and training and research and development. So going forwards in collaboration with our members and led by a governance group that we're pulling together, um, we will be working to define best practice for digital twin. So look out for some additional knowledge resources and for capacity building opportunities that we'll be facilitating, um, for example, digital twin training. Um, our goal, uh, to build a thriving digital twin marketplace through collaboration. If you're interested in finding out more, you can visit the hub and also remember to save the date for Digital Twin Week, which is 10th to 23rd of October 2020. Um, alternatively, feel free to contact me um, and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you, Hamish. All right, thank you very much, uh, Janet. You had a point in there just about value. I'm just wondering if you or any of the other panellists can give me something more tangible about the value that, that a digital twin could bring. Um, you know, what, what it, each dollar in produces, produces what, for example. Uh, we've heard a lot about environmental benefits from better management of our, of our cities in particular. 
can you give me some tangible examples of the real value that that moving to a digital twin uh, could bring? Um, oh, sorry, Mark. Mark's going to answer that. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, sort of quickly, um, really, really, really good question because you have to understand the value that you're wanting from it in order to actually even even go down this road of a digital twin. So. The value is driven by the reasoning for, for pulling this digital twin together. So part, part around New Zealand, there's different reasons for looking at a lot of the smart cities initiatives that we're engaging in. Um, and the value that those organizations involved in that, the councils, the research groups, the um, industry stakeholders, for each instance, they're looking for something different. Potentially for a national digital twin, there are a number of synergies, but but really good question because unless you're actually identified and um, your stakeholders are involved in that decision process around the value the twin um, needs to produce, there really isn't any point going down that journey. Ah. Yeah, I mean, f firstly, just to strongly agree with what Janet just, just said there, uh, we, we think that uh, digital twin should be strongly uh, led by purpose. And in fact, in those uh, principles that I share, the Gemini principles, uh, it's built around purpose, trust and function. Um, but without purpose, a digital twin is just a toy. So, so definitely driven by purpose. Uh, and, and kind of each, each twin then and each connection between twins can be driven by, um, by real value driven business case. But what we think that adds up to potentially uh, some work done by uh, Deloitte in the UK uh, indicated something like £7 billion per year. So, so you know, that adds up to a very big number. Um, so I guess we can come at this value question from a number of different angles. You know, the, the individual value of an individual digital twin, which should drive the whole development of that twin, uh, or you add it up to a whole nation level and it becomes a big number. Right, thanks very much. Excellent question there, Sean. You um, produce some quite in-depth data there. Um, how long has it taken you to Wellington to produce that data? And, and sort of how feasible is it for anybody other than perhaps Wellington, Auckland and Christchurch to, to develop, maintain um, and, and apply this data? Um, the bigger the city, the harder it is in terms of the geographic footprint. Wellington has some unique advantages in that it's highly concentrated. We only live on a third of our land area, so it makes it easy to measure. Uh, what you're seeing is the outcome of a digital consciousness. Because we've become conscious relatively early of the digital footprints our people leave and how those footprints can help us, it's become part of our practice, a digital dividend, if you would. And so that's what helps make it live. So for example, the big three-dimensional city data sets, we're just processing our fourth iteration of those now. So it's very possible. And with actions like the Provincial Growth Fund LIDAR and uh, some of the big uh, infrastructure projects being pursued by people like the NZTA, we're probably closer to being able to do it nationally than ever before in our history. All right. Well, I think I would like to kick on to that, that national picture and, and that question around who and, and how. Um, uh, Greg, I wonder if maybe you can just sort of kick off with a, a, a description of who you think might be best to help try to lead some of this data standardization, provide some a bit of detail on where it's kept and then how we, how we might be able to apply it consistently. Thanks, Hamish. Well, there are a number of um, activities going on around the country uh, for around data standardization and NZTA is taking the lead in the roading sector, transport sector. We're taking a lead in the water sector. We've got master spec taking a lead in, um, in the vertical builds. Um, and, but there, there needs something to pull those together. And there is a, there's a place here for central government or an agency that is at least funded by central government. I think the Infrastructure Commission is a very interesting place because of their, their remit of being uh, funded by government, but taking that long-term view of infrastructure. But there are some incentives that are needed for some councils to come on board because they don't, it's hard for them to get the benefit, uh, for them to see the benefit. But once they start sharing their data and it's all linked up, they will see the benefit. Mark, you guys are obviously further down the track than us. Do you have any um, specific thoughts around 
how you get something like a national digital twin up and running. Um, did you have champions in the UK? Was there someone or something um, that was principally responsible for you making progress? Um, and any particular learnings for us? Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a lot of questions in there. Um, and I, I would hope that there'd be a, a lot of really useful learning um, for you guys. Um, but I would say that it, it should be two ways because there'll be stuff that you learn on your journey that would benefit us as well. But, but certainly, um, I think that um, having a good foundation in BIM has been really useful for us uh, because um, a lot of the thinking in BIM, um, I think, kind of moves naturally into then considering digital twins and connected digital twins. So, so, so having that good foundation, I think, is, is really important. Um, I think that the government sponsorship is also huge um, because... Um, there is a danger in this that everyone just rushes off and does their own thing. They think this is a great idea. Um, you know, let's have a digital twin. They all develop their own digital twins, but they develop it in their own way. And then there's no way that those digital twins can talk to each other. So it kind of needs something at a government type level uh, that can create the market within which um, you know, many can thrive. So I, I think the government sponsorship has been absolutely huge for us. Um, but I have to say that that's, that's grown out of government sponsoring BIM in the first place. And so it's been really good to have that continuity. Um, and then you asked about champions. Um, what we see is that there's actually a, a quite a, a large community of people who are, are seeing the same vision. Uh, and so what's really good is to, to bring those people together. And I think that uh, that's one of the things that the DT Hub is doing this community of practitioners who you know, are, are actually working on digital twins. But uh, if you add them all up, um, you know, out of 60 million people in the UK, there's probably you know, a few hundred who are working on digital twins. Um, but if you can bring those few hundred together, then that's really powerful. Um, and so I think that um, we have got a number of champions. This is not a, just a one man band. Um, you know, there's a number, but bringing them together, we think is, is really valuable. Um, and then one, one final thing to say is that um, we've had for quite a long time a really good relationship um, between CDBB and our infrastructure client group in the UK, which is made up of uh, the major national infrastructure owner operators. Uh, and, and we think that that's really significant as well, <clears throat> because um, if they are driving consistency in their requests for digital twins, uh, then we see that the supply chain is likely to line up uh, and, and give the clients what they ask for. So, so getting some coordination uh, in the requirements seems to be a really important thing as well. Anyway, I, I think there's, there would be loads of, loads of lessons and something that we'd be interested in exploring is you know, how, we can, how we can share those lessons. Yeah, no, well, Something fantastic. No, well, we'll be we'll be keen to learn more. Um, I've got a question come through about the cost. How much money do we need to get this thing up and running? Sure, and I, I, I'm, I know you've got some some thoughts, but if if we start to kick a digital twin off, how much money does does the government maybe have to spend? Who else has to put their hand in their pocket? How much you got? <laughs> um, <laughs> To be honest, I don't know how much money it costs. Um, the trouble is the definition of a digital twin continues to evolve. So it gets more and more detailed as you get more and more capability. So we know that uh, it, that for a reform of something like the planning system for all of local government to uh, adopt that, you are talking millions of dollars uh, in data investment and capability investment. What is equally key though, is the culture around it, particularly within the public service. Without that understanding of how it works, why it's important, and that commitment to adopting standards, getting rid of the not made here problem, um, you're probably not gonna be able to buy your way out of the problem. Mark, what, what, what does it take to get um, the Centre for Digital Built Britain up and running and, and whatnot? Yeah, so, so um, we've basically been working on, on the preparation for the delivery for a couple of years. And I mentioned a few of the things that we've, we've done in that time, the whole thing about the values. Uh, we spent last year doing some quite detailed work 
uh, to understand what we think is needed in the semantic solution that I mentioned. Uh, and and that's, that's actually quite tough because you've got to bring together a number of different communities, uh, particularly the information management community and the data science community. They don't always see things the same way. Uh, and so uh, you know, there's quite a lot of preparation in there of, of bringing people together, developing consensus so that, so that we got into a place of knowing what we want to do. Um, so I would say that that, that, that was two years of, of preparation of, of kind of laying, laying all of those foundations. Um, and that was, uh, I would say, relatively cheap. Uh, you know, it's measured in um, millions, you know, less than the fingers on one hand. Uh, um, so that, that element of it is, uh, it, I, I think, is very cheap. When it comes to the uh, actual implementation, um, I'm not sure I'd be at liberty to say what we put in on the business case, uh, but um, you know, it, it's not hundreds of millions. It's, it's tens of millions um, for a three-year program uh, to coordinate others. But this is an important thing, I think, to, to say, that, that I, I think that the central coordination costs uh, can be very small for a very large benefit for a lot of other people who also need to invest. So I think when it comes to the, the government investment cost compared to the overall industry investment cost, uh, it, it's a small number, a very small number. Uh, particularly when you compare it to that seven billion that I talked about of the, of the benefits, um, but what it should do uh, is is make it worth others investing their own money because they're convinced of the business case. Uh, and you know that that earlier thing that Janet and I picked up on on the purpose that if each individual digital twin has a purpose uh, and it's worth it's investable, it's worth investing in it, uh, then the reason for that investment will be because it's got a payback. Uh, you know, in, in other words, all of this will make perfect business sense. Uh, and the thing that unlocks it uh, is, a, is a relatively small amount of government money that provides the coordination that creates the market in the first place and gets the ball rolling. And one of the, one of the analogies that we've made here is that we need to collaborate on the rules uh, and then compete on the game. Uh, and, and the clever thing here is to work out where we need to bring people together to collaborate on what the rules are once we've established the rules of the game, then you can have many go off and play the game. But unless you know what the rules are, the game is going to be really difficult. Uh, and so what we're doing, the small amount of investment at the government level is just investing in the rules. And then we've got a huge amount of investment in the game. I hope that makes right, sense. Thank you. Janet, I'm really interested in what the Aussies are doing. Are they ahead of us? Uh, that's always a good spur to action there. Uh, but obviously your, your group has, has been active in Australia. What, what's going on there? And is there something we need to be following um, in some or all of the Australian cities? So um, thanks, Hamish. So um, that's the National Digital Twin Symposium that we held last year was the digital twin community. Um, and what's come out of that, as I mentioned, is the task force and then the hub. So, so just following on again from what Britain's done. Um, and, and so, yeah, so what we've put together is that digital twin hub. And I think more importantly, that centre for data leadership that we've pulled together. So we're talking about data and that's where the conversation really needs to start. And there are a number of sort of things to consider. Um, and that's where the community is at the moment around um, around data as a starting point. So, you know, what is what is um, data leadership and raising awareness around the essential elements like purpose, privacy, security, ethics, building opportunities around key open data activation platforms. So, um, and convening government leaders. So, sort of mentioning that again around the the, the requirement to have that buy-in from government, but not necessarily driven by government. Um, and but we actually inform them policy and programs and initiatives. So that's where we're at across Australia, um, and then and then obviously the the hub is for Australia and New Zealand. Um, going back to this, if I could just quickly say around the question around cost, um, I think the more important question, Hamish, is how much are we going to save? How much are we going to save with a national digital twin? Because what's happening at the moment is digital twins um, initiatives at a number of um, with a number of councils and other organisations around the country, um, and I think the question is: the question is, how much are we going to save if we have a national digital twin that actually, like Mark has referred to, um, where we collaborate on its purpose and and what we sort of want from that foundational platform, and then we leverage that for our individual sort of value value generation? I think that's the more important question, and I think that's where that's where the focus needs to be in those two areas: is who do we bring to the party and get um, get their buy-in. 
and 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 who who sort of coordinates that um, and has has sort of that role. And secondly, the conversation around data to start at that point around data um, and leadership um, around data and make sure people are, are comfortable with that conversation around sharing data, um, pulling it together. If you think about the three types of digital twin, that aggregation one is what we're talking about. Um, earlier, it was referred to as a system of systems. I mean, our system of systems is 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 software across the country that that hasn't been out of you know you could have to dust it off to make it work. Um, so it's around and around the money that we can save if we pull together. Janet posed a few questions there um, around around the who. Does anybody have any other thoughts around you know who who is going to help aggregate this data and and uh, in New, particularly in the New Zealand context? Um, Sean. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you'll see from the document that was written, many of the infrastructure consultancies are already into this game. They are eager um, and they've got tremendous skills and developing platforms. And we've got a, we've got a fantastic um, system called Next, Next Space, which, which was developed in New Zealand. There's lots of things that are all ready to go. Um, and I think once you unleash this with a bit of government help, we will see a lot of people coming to the marketplace. I've had a question come through, which I think is an interesting one too, which is, is a national digital twin more than the sum of a bunch of individual digital, digital twins? Do we need to manage this nationally or can it be more organic? I think it needs to be an organic. I, I believe there's organic, but there needs a coordinating. There needs to be some coordination. This is not. This is not um, a central control. It is a marketplace, and so um, we have to make sure that the standards are right. Everyone agrees on the standards, and the twins will evolve to solve the problems that are that are out there. Yeah. Can I maybe make a go on this as well? Because I, yeah. I think that this is um, um, an absolutely key question, uh, and it's one that we have been uh, grappling with, and it's part of what um, our benefits realisation will will try to pick up on. Um, but but I do strongly agree with what Greg just said. Uh, I think that overall, the national digital twin has to be organic. Uh, we we definitely don't think that the national digital twin is one massive twin of everything. We think that would be a disaster. Uh, we see it as an ecosystem of connected twins. So each of those uh, individual twins makes sense on its own, as we said earlier on. But then if we can connect them up, uh, then we think we can release more value. And I think that's what the, the, the question really goes to the heart of, um, is saying if you've got all these unconnected twins, you've got lots of them, we know they will each be of value. That's great. We love that. Um, but what if we can connect them? And is there value in connecting the twins? So I, th I think the, the question actually goes right to the heart uh, of, of the value of a national digital twin, because the national digital twin just means connecting them up. Um, and what connecting them up means uh, is, um, uh, is securely sharing data. It's all about secure, resilient data sharing across organizational boundaries. Uh, and, and we kind of know that that is a value. One of the things which we slightly struggle with in the UK is knowing at which level to describe this because at one level we can describe the national digital twin uh, as something which is really fun it's like the internet of infrastructure and people love the idea of that but don't know what it means or you can describe it in very boring terms well it's actually about sharing data and nobody's interested in sharing data but actually that's the heart of it and both of them are true it's both are true but anyway coming to the value of this you can kind of see the value that if you've got um, an energy network uh, and you've got digital twin of each of the components of that energy network, you've got a digital twin of the energy network, you've got a digital twin of the transport network, and then somebody comes along with a bright idea of something like electric vehicles, and you say, okay, well, is an electric vehicle charging network, is that, is that the energy network or is that the transport network? And you think, oh, actually it's both. So why wouldn't we then connect the data between our energy and our transport um, digital twins? And the answer is, of course you would. Uh, and so I think it, it's, it's this, it's these kind of inter-system um, uh, value cases, which is where the connections would, would really come in. Um, and I think we're going to identify more and more um, of those use cases for connections between, uh, between sectors. And just picking up on uh, some of Sean's points, 
I think that um, it's really in the context of cities that we will see the major benefit. Because it's nice in theory to be able to connect a water network with an energy network, with a transport network, with a telecoms network. And you think, oh, that's all very theoretical. But where does it matter? Where it matters is in a city, because that's where all of those networks come together to serve people. And so having data between those networks that is shareable really matters in a city. Uh, and so I think we'll, we'll have a load of very compelling use cases for the connection between twins and not just individual twins. Ben, sorry, Sean. Yes, um, the trouble is if we don't get good leadership from central government on this stuff is that each of the major cities will develop their own thing and you'll be subject to the tyranny of geography. So a lot of our utilities cross multiple boundaries. Most of our development companies develop in more than one city. If you don't have a standardized system across the whole country, you won't have a national market. You'll have a series of regional markets. And we, we already experienced that problem. The other part is if you take um, an example. So for example, uh, we take the trees grown on council's lands, into them into the ETS, and then sell those carbon credits to fund conservation. That's a, a very useful income stream to council, and it's one that can be replicated across the whole country if they have the data in a replicable form. And you could imagine that if that's possible in a relatively dense city like Wellington, the amounts of carbon that's being captured in the more provincial areas of the, the country could provide a very real stream of investment to those councils. All right, I see my chief has popped up on the screen, which is a subtle hint to me, I think. Um, does anybody else have any other um, just sort of final closing thoughts or anything else that they wanted to quickly scream out? Can I just, um, Hamish, say that just going on um, what Sean just said and agreeing, I guess, with everybody else as well, is that um, a, fine, a point that's coming to light um, with part of this conversation and that's fundamental is that the demand be driven from the cities. So the demand be driven from not the tech sector wanting to have a toy that they need to then on sell and, and get, create some value from. It's actually what are we going to do, going back to the initial point about value, but it ha very much has to be driven from the cities and the people that are um, responsible for those cities, the council, but co-creation with the communities um, and not from the tech sector. Um, that's what I would say, but bringing on board the tech sector and academia as part of that conversation. Yes, yeah, so got a few nods there. I think um, that's a good comment uh, to close it all off. Janet, all right. Well, thank you all for your time uh, and comments today. I thought that was a very interesting session. Paul, over to you. Yeah, well, my thanks as well to, to Janet, to Mark and Sean and Greg. It's fantastic. Um, I repeat again that um, we've had some really high engagement and a lot of questions here. So perhaps use your network of networks to, to, to reach out to these folk here and get involved in those further and follow-up events. Um, I also wanted to point out that we've already had in that report, we had Becker, Oricon, Quake Centre, Mock McDonald, Canterbury Uni, Auckland Uni, Wellington City Council, GHD, Tonkin Taylor, NZ Tech, and Infrastructure New Zealand already contributing to this report. So um, if Mark mentioned maybe 200 people active in Digital Twins and we've had 200 odd people on this call, there's already a quite a groundswell here that we can perhaps leverage. I think we keep coming back um, and Janet finished it really well on the why. So um, our finance minister in producing his $50 billion bazooka last week, uh, in his build up to that, he said something along the lines of, if your house burnt down, you wouldn't necessarily build back the same house, you'd build it back better. And to me, that's our why. We're gonna spend unprecedented amounts of money here uh, for a long period of time and, and sustainability, risk, uh, understanding our environment, and they're all gonna be part of it. So I think that that's, that's perhaps our why. Um, some fascinating stuff. Um, again, a vision for a digital built Britain was at the heart of uh, Mark's piece. You know, we need our, our why there coming through. I love that idea of systems of systems and that there are multiple benefits coming through here because what, quite literally this is visual. Um, like the idea of the Gemini principles and it sounds like that if we haven't already is something that we should all be having a good look at in those core principles and those data standards that we need to have a look at. Um, 
always like an evidence base. So Greg talked a lot about that, about its role for insurance and risk management and other things. And with Internet of Things and Industry 4.0, perhaps we can have the really dynamic information that Sean talked about that helps us make really fantastic decisions. Because I agree, this, um, this is not just uh, the cities, it is a, a wider countryside, but it really is the heart of smarter cities that's going to be whether we succeed or fail as a country. And that's simply because 87% of Kiwis live in an urban area. Um, I think that uh, we probably need to have a look as well at um, the, the alignment to the sustainable development goals. I thought, Janet, that was a great point. You know, this really can build better for us. Uh, the Centre for Data Leadership's obviously got some great stuff coming up and 10th to the 23rd of October, I think you mentioned, for uh, Digital Twin Week. So plenty of opportunities for people to get involved. Um, I know we've got some people from the Infrastructure Commission on this call, which is, you know, again, a great opportunity for them to, to be involved. That is one of the agencies that would be a good place for this to go. Uh, we're obviously hopeful that the Shovel Ready projects will come up with some money for this. Um, but I think when I spoke to one of the speakers before, they suggested the Nike emblem. So it's a just do it, right? Uh, finally, I've, I'm on the Construction Sector Accord. The Construction Sector Accord has a transformation plan for that $40 billion industry. Um, so I've done my bit and passed that report through. That construction secret report has seven ministers reporting through it. So I hope it will get some airplay there. Uh, but I really wanted to thank you all. This is one of the, uh, the highest number of question and answers we've had. Heaps of participation. Uh, look, at, look on our website later on uh, for a recording of this. Pass it on. Also look for the report. I uh, wanted to thank you once and again to all of our speakers for your contribution probably have gone on for a few more hours. There's a lot of questions.